you know, I always find it funny when I talk to uh, people that say that, you know, they were Catholic from uh, first through 12th grade, they went to Catholic school, and then they always preface it by saying I'm ha- I had trouble with, you know, fill in the blank. And then what they come up with is, uh, you know, a theology, uh, you know, from a Protestant denomination, like almost word for word, like they came up with that on their own, rather than them being shown from, uh, you know, the Protestant Church. So that's just one thing. I just wanted to know how you felt about that. And then second, uh, the reason I'm asking really is I'm about ready to teach um, a confirmation class again at a different parish. And uh, I was wondering how you would handle, like, not getting too heavily involved in, let's say, the history or the numbers versus not getting too light. And so I don't want to lose them on the too heavy, mm-hmm. but I don't want to be too light. So I, I'll, I'll listen to your comments here. Yeah, thanks. So let me, let me see. I understand the first question is that when people leave the Catholic faith, they often justify leaving the faith by by uh, singling out some particular Catholic dogma and saying, well, I didn't find this dogma to be true because I found blank, and they usually give whatever the Protestant sort of alternative to that is, and that seems more compelling to them. And do I? And, and your objection to that is it seems like they didn't independently discover the truth of this Protestant doctrine, but they sort of absorbed it either from the culture or from maybe, you know, somebody proselytized them, and they've used, they've persuaded themselves of the truth of this. It's provided them with a justification for their decision to leave the Church. I think you're dead right. I think you're dead right. Um, uh, the, the research shows that when the, most people who leave the Church and join another Christian denomination— the, the primary reason they give in survey after survey is that their spiritual needs weren't being met within the Catholic faith, all right? And, and what that—I take that quite seriously, and I believe it. I think that's true, right? I think that there were pastoral failures in their relationship to the Catholic Church that, that made it impossible for them to connect to Catholic liturgy and doctrine and devotion, spirituality and, and, and moral life— in a way that they felt to be transformative and positive, and so they went and sought that someplace else. Now, uh, uh, as a historian of religion, not just of Catholicism, I also think that you can get people to believe just about anything. I mean, you could start the Church of the Mystic Hamburger, <laughs> and if you follow a, the right kind of formula, which is to you know, kind of make moral demands on people and give them a message of, of sort of uh, of transcendent meaning and and, and and provide community for them and give them a community of discourse in which they kind of begin to share ideas and concepts with people whose affection they want and whom they want to impress. You you can you can coerce them into believing just about anything. So I really don't think the specific doctrines are are necessarily what draw them out of the church. I think that there are people sometimes who are frustrated with the church, who who at a subconscious level go looking to justify that frustration by maybe doing apologetical investigations and reading texts. But what really motivates them is their dissatisfaction, and what what they end up with is going to depend basically on just what literature they read or which or what group they fall into. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think there's some great truth in that intuition that you just had. Um, you know, by the same token. Catholics can also rely on some of those same sociological truths. The more we gather around people and give them a sense of community, the more we help them to like share a common sort of universe of discourse, the more we provide them with a message of transcendent meaning that's embodied both in our rituals and our lives, the more they're going to connect to the doctrines of the Church and find them meaningful and embrace mm-hmm. them, right? So sure. that goes to the second question, which is about the proper mode of confirmation. And... Uh, uh, the research also shows that the vast majority of kids that get confirmed, say, age 13, 14, will not be practicing practicing the faith seven years down the line. And by the time they get out of college, the numbers are quite devastating these days, right? So most of the defections from the Catholic faith take place before the age of, say, 25, right? So this is a really critical question that you're asking, how to go about confirmation. Uh, at preparing for confirmation. And, of course, this is not my specific area of ministry expertise. There are others who are much, much more uh, skilled and knowledgeable about this age group and their developmental needs than I am. But I will give you some general general thoughts from working with some of these folks. Uh, the doctrine of the faith is important. History of the Church is important. 
uh, at the end of the day, I don't think those are the things that are going to determine whether or not these kids uh, leave the church when they're 18, 19, 20. I think it's it's much more those psychological and sociological conditions of have they learned to connect to the church uh, and the community of the faithful in a way that gives them a life of transcendent meaning, right? And so uh, I think when you're involved in youth ministry of any kind, it, it's it's important to teach Catholic doctrine. It's important to teach Catholic morality. It's important to teach do the catechesis. But it's it's vastly more important to find ways to actually connect young people to the life of the church. Uh, here are some things that work. Uh, kids resonate, humans resonate, adults resonate with service. So many confirmation programs will require that kids do service work. Uh, but the more that can be coordinated to the actual life of the parish, the more effective it is. You know, when you can get them on youth service days where they can feel good about their contributions as Catholic, where they can see other Catholics, maybe grown-up Catholics. Uh, Catholics are great at doing charity. We're terrible at advertising it. You know, there's so many unsung heroes. And, you know, that, that there's there's virtue in that, of course, yeah, right? Yeah. But the the problem is, you know, you might look down the street and some, you know, Protestant megachurch, they've all got on, you know, T-shirts that say, you know, like, you know, Church of the Mystic Hamburger out, you know, doing, you know, a uh, uh, food handout for the sure, homeless. Sure, sure. And it's very evident that they're involved in social ministry. Sometimes the way Catholics do it, it's not as evident. So the more you can get them involved in seeing Catholics do work and put them involved where they can feel connected to it, that's very useful, right? Um, Eucharistic adoration. Uh, tends to resonate really, really well with young people. I, I think better with young people sometimes than with other age groups. Uh, those can be guided meditations. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people have music involved or, or you know, or, or maybe prayers that have been provided for them. But, uh, but, but anything you can do like that. Uh, going on retreat and pilgrimages, uh, <clears throat> many, many young people will point to their retreat experience as a time when they made a personal decision to commit themselves more deeply to the life of the Catholic faith. So all of those kinds of things outside of the liturgy that can help young people actually find points of meaningful connection to and participation in the life of the Church go a long way to helping them stay Catholic. <laughs>